My name is Dan Walter, and I'm the new guy around here. Uh, after 18 years away from Grand Island, uh, my wife and, and I are back. Our kids have come along with us for the first time here uh, as, the, as we've journeyed back here to Grand Island. And uh, in a lot of ways, it's just really, really good to be uh, what we feel like is home. Uh, one area of life uh, that's most difficult about this is, is driving. Uh, we uh, have been in, in uh, Omaha for the last several years. Uh, raise your hand if you love driving in Omaha. All right. Uh, raise your hand if you would like to do anything else in the world except for drive in Omaha. Okay, you are not going to like me for a couple of minutes here. Uh, I love driving in Omaha because it's fast and you can get to where you're wanting to go if you know the right way to go. Uh, and, and when we come here, it's a little slower, right? Uh, we like to use the word relaxed. Uh, that's, that's a nicer, nicer word to use. I've had to explain to my kids who learned how to drive, somewhat learned how to drive, in, uh, that was a joke just for them. Uh, <laughs> they learned in Omaha, and then they come here, and they're like, Dad, it's so slow. And I said, you just need to start thinking of the four-way stops as a rest area. You know, like, <laughs> just get the picnic lunch out and set it on the, t on the chair and enjoy it, because you're going to be there for six or seven minutes. It's, it, it's really not that hard, is it? You get to the stop sign, you go. Um, and so, uh, and then roundabouts just make that a whole new experience for some people who like to go right over the middle of them. And so, uh, uh, it's good to be here. Uh, as you know, uh, when I was walking out here, we're kicking off a new series uh, called Unexpected, and it has nothing to do with me being on stage. Uh, the team here at Third City does a great job of planning and implementing these series based on a lot of prayer and discernment about where God is wanting to take our church, about what God is wanting to teach us and challenge us in. Uh, and if you're like me, you were really challenged over the last four weeks in the Radical series as we asked some really important questions of ourselves uh, with the goal of grabbing on to the real thing, a life fully lived out in and for Jesus Christ. And over the next few weeks, we'll be exploring three of the most incredible and unexpected stories from the Gospels, stories of resurrection and of new life. Our desire is that each one of us will see the ways God is wanting to work in and through us and will experience renewal and resurrection in a powerful way. And as we get closer to Easter, uh, we want to see a whole bunch of people who are just starting to ask questions about God show up. And so when you came in this morning, you noticed that there were some business cards, business card size invitations on your chairs. And, uh, and you also should have received a postcard when you, and a pencil when you walked in this morning. If you didn't, you should try to get one. Uh, but maybe this would have been a good week for you to bring the trapper keeper, right? Uh, we've got a lot of stuff. If, if you don't understand that joke, congratulations on being young. Uh, and so, uh, but those of us who are, we'll say 30 and above, maybe we understand that joke. Um, this morning, uh, we are going to be camping out in uh, Luke chapter 8 and uh, Ephesians chapter 2. So if you want to bookmark those, we'll have them on the screen as well, or get your device headed in the right direction. Uh, that's where we'll be. Uh, we hope you'll take those Easter cards and you'll give those to the people around you. Uh, the people that you've been praying for, the people you've been building relationships with, the people that you're in school with, young people, the people you work with, uh, that, that people would know that there is a place for him and we're doing everything we can to make a seat available for people here at Third City for that morning. Uh, when our son, who had, I think kind of told you he's driving age, he's 15 years old, but when he was two years old, we had been going through a little bout of the flu with him. And uh, for about a week, he had been sick and doing everything little two-year-olds do when they're sick, a lot of whining especially. Uh, and uh, uh, we didn't realize just how dehydrated he was. And so one night, in the middle of the night, he woke up and he just couldn't breathe right. I don't know if you've experienced that with a, with a young one, but it was like hyperventilating and he just wasn't getting uh, a deep breath. It was called croup. But... Parents didn't know that, right? It's kind of a gross word anyway. And so uh, we did the responsible thing that most parents will do. We went to www.webmd.com, right? And so, so we were looking for a cure there, looking for a fix. We didn't know the word croup. We had no idea what was going on. Figured he swallowed a Lego or something like that. 
And so uh, after five minutes of trying to get our online medical degree, we decided it was time to take him to the emergency room. Uh, and as you can imagine, I've already told you I'm kind of in a hurry when I'm driving. One of my favorite phrases when I'm frustrated driving is, uh, drive, where, drive like you've got somewhere to go. You know, and, and so I'll yell that. No one can hear me. It does no good, but it lets off some frustration. But I was in a hurry on the way to the hospital, and so I'm breaking speed limits and, and maybe running through a couple of red lights after I make sure no one's coming. Uh, I was more than a little concerned and even scared for the health of my son. And when we got to the hospital, I took on the very reasonable dad role. Some of you guys know this, right? Uh, basically, it sounds something like this. I don't care how bloodied and broken you or your child are. Get in line right? Like my child's first. And, and we all know that feeling when you go to the doctor, or when you take a child to the doctor or a loved one, and you're, you're waiting in there with like 30 other sick, disgusting people, right? And, and the nurse comes to the door, and there's like a halo that shines through the door. And everyone's staring at the nurse, and, and they're waiting for him or her to say, Dan Walter. But it's never the way it happens, right? There's about a dozen other names that get called before your name. And you start to get frustrated and you start to think about how much work you're missing or how much family time you're missing. The frustration builds and it grows and, and you're just ticked off. We're going to read a story that probably uh, reminds us a little bit of that. And so now that we're all a little bit stressed and maybe even a little bit angry, let's read the Bible together. <laughs> Luke chapter 8, starting in verse 40. Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, really important guy, like really, really important guy, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there, who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. But no one could heal her. In another account of this, it tells her she had spent her whole life savings to try and find a cure for her condition. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Jesus asked, who touched me? When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing all around you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Important little phrase there. Then he said to her daughter, Your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and said, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he didn't let anyone go in with him except for Peter, John, and James, and the, and the child's parents. Meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, just asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. And we know they failed at that because we're reading this 2,000 years later. This is one of those stories that's, that's really a wow story, isn't it? And, and there's a lot crammed in there, and there's, there's a lot of different directions we could go. Uh, there's desperation on a lot of levels. Uh, there's a lot of love, no doubt. There's probably some frustration on the part of a dad who has to wait what must have seemed like more than two hours in a waiting room. There's incredible grief as a dad received the worst kind of news and a couple of unexpected results that led to new and restored life. There's really a lot of directions we could go, but I want to focus on a couple of things that have always kind of stood out to me from this passage. And the first one of those is Jesus meets us in both the crisis and the condition of our lives. No doubt we can all recognize the crisis moment here, right? 
It, it's one of those everything hinges on this moment situations. Literally a life and death situation. Uh, probably most of us can relate to this. We've had uh, someone who's incredibly sick or someone close to us who has died. And if Jesus were physically here on earth, we would walk or drive or fly wherever we had to to go get him, right? And, and we would say, Jesus, come into our house, come into our town and heal this person that I love so much. We would do that because love causes us to do really, really big things. And to be certain... Uh, not all of our crisis moments are life and death, right? Your, your, your March Madness bracket is busted, right? Uh, and that's just kind of a joke, but it's kind of weird in my house. My wife and son both have teams in the finals, and they spent maybe a combined 30 seconds making their decisions. And uh, I got knocked out, and it makes no sense to me. Crisis. But there's some real things that are crisis in our life. Sudden job loss, a shattered family, Marriage that isn't working, it's gone off the rails. A diagnosis that you've dreaded, uh, the ending of a long time friendship. There's those moments in our life when it just feels like everything has gone off the tracks and, and, it, and it feels like a crisis and you know that it is. And we need to know that we have a God who will meet us in those moments of crisis just like Jesus met Jairus in this one. And we pray for a miracle and sometimes we get it and oftentimes that miracle is simply peace when peace seems impossible. We ask God to help us to get through these moments. Someone said being challenged in life is unavoidable. But being defeated, that's optional. You don't have to be defeated by the crisis in your life. And Zig Ziglar said, always remember that your present situation is not your final destination. But the best quote I could find at this comes from what we just read from Luke 8, when Jesus says, don't be afraid, just have faith. Scholars have uh, looked at that verse a lot, and they've counted up how many times that takes place uh, from cover to cover in the Bible. And you know the number? 365. Doesn't seem very coincidental to me. Uh, that there is one for every day of the year for us to be reminded in some way, don't be afraid. Don't let fear grab you. And if you're like me, fear is one of those things that creeps up on you. It's one of those things that can ruin a day and control your life. One for every day. Author and preacher uh, Lloyd Olgovy says that there are 366. So you're covered even in a leap year. Uh, we are a people who need to be reminded, don't be afraid, have faith. Jesus knew we'd need to hear that a lot. Uh, and if you want to know when you can expect to have that mastered, I'll just let you know from my own life, I'll let you know. Because I'm not there. And you're not there. No one in this room is there. It's one of those struggles that just keeps coming back and coming back and coming back. And from the woman in this story... We see that Jesus will meet us in the conditions of our life. And usually, those seem like the more difficult things to bring before Jesus. You see, she had dealt with this gynecological condition for 12 years, just as long as Jairus' daughter had been alive. It had become her new normal. She lives as an outcast, ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. Desperation leads her to give this wives' tale treatment a shot, and it works. But Jesus goes deeper into her life to deal with some other issues, we'll, which we'll get to just a little bit later. All of us have conditions, whether it's medical or relational or whatever other kind of condition. We have things that keep us from living life in the way it could be lived. And while we're quick to see, seek help or prayer for a crisis in life, we often try to white-knuckle our way through the conditions. We, we tend to think, you know, if I just give it a little bit of time, it'll go away. It'll get better, right? If I, if I just wait it out, these conditions will, will go into the background. And it won't be such a big deal. We're, we're quick to seek help for a crisis, but we're really slow sometimes in our conditions. You know, if that weren't true, we wouldn't have TV shows like Hoarders, right? Where, where someone decides, I'm just going to collect a few things, 
and then suddenly they can't walk through their house. We want to have shows like my daughter's favorite online show, uh, Dr. Pimple Popper. Have you seen this? It's disgusting. If you haven't seen it, save yourself. It, it's not about pimples. It's about these huge growths. And, uh, and that starts because someone gets a little bump on their neck and they're like, oh, well, that'll go away. And a couple of weeks later, the, the bump's bigger and they're like, oh, I'll wear a turtleneck. It's all good, right? And then suddenly they have a second head and they've got to head to the doctor to help to get help for that. And, and we wouldn't have things like that if we were a people who tended to take care of the conditions in our life. Every single one of us lives with a condition called a sin condition. Every single one of us lives with that. Uh, when we read the word sin in Scripture, the literal meaning is to miss the mark. See, the mark is perfection, and only one human has ever hit it, and his name was Jesus. Jesus. And you're not going to, and I'm not going to. Romans 3.23 tells us uh, something really true. It says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all a messed up people in native, need of a Savior. Are you tracking with that? We are all messed up people, sinful people in need of a Savior. And so I want to do something this morning uh, that, that's going to require you to be vulnerable. It's going to require you to, to have a little bit of trust and, and just to be really honest. When you walked in this morning, you were handed a postcard and a pencil. I want you to get that ready. We're going to put 10 questions up on the screen. And I'm simply going to ask you to answer honestly yes or no to each of those questions. Now, you need to know this. If you already wrote your name on there, scratch it out. This is completely anonymous completely anonymous. Nobody's going to know who you are. These are difficult questions, and it's going to teach us a lot about who we are and what we need. And so, so, so keep your eyes on your own paper, right? It's like we're back in seventh grade. Uh, don't cheat and uh, answer these questions as honestly as you can. As you're finishing that up, we'll leave those up there, but the ushers are going to come right now uh, with baskets. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to place your card in that basket, face down, completely anonymous, and then they're going to take them to the back, and very quickly they're going to reshuffle them and bring them back up front and pass them out. And you're going to take a card. If you put a card in, we want you to take a card out. You're not going to know whose card it is. No one's going to know if they've got your card. And so if the ushers would come now and bring those baskets, uh, and then immediately, as soon as you receive those, if you would start passing those back out again, uh, we're going to do something here that shows us that we are in this together. <clears throat> Second thing we learn from this passage is that encounters with Jesus lead to new life. You see, when we are willing to let Jesus work in the muck and mire of our mess, transformation takes place. One of my favorite chapters in the Bible is Ephesians chapter 2, and the first five uh, verses say this, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, some translations say wrath, just like everyone else. Here's the two words that make it my favorite. But God, in the midst of all of our messiness, we read that but God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. I want you to listen to how the message translates that last verse. He took our sin-dead lives and made us alive in Christ. You see, there's no doubt that when the woman heard the word daughter, her life was radically changed. 
And there is absolutely no doubt that Jairus' daughter was never the same after she heard, my child, get up. If we had time to have an open mic here, which we don't, but we do that during Rooted Celebration and we have some people share their stories, we'd be amazed to hear the stories of transformation among so many of you about how Jesus came into a life that was pretty messed up and how, how uh, he transform us, transforms us more into uh, his image. I don't do mathematics a lot, <laughs> but I think this one's pretty true. Our messy lives plus the received grace of God through Jesus equals transformation every time. Our messy lives plus the received grace of God through Jesus equals transformation every time. And maybe a question we have to ask ourselves is whether we really believe that Jesus looks at us like an adoring father looks at their child and whether he would go to any length like a man like Jairus or like a dad speeding through the city of Lincoln would go to for you. See, we say the phrase love unlimited around here a lot. And we see some really good examples. The way you've responded to the flooding, both financially and with your time, blows us away. We're amazed at your love unlimited for the people around you. But understand this, until I get to the point, until you get to the point of really understanding and believing that God loves me, loves you in an unlimited way, my attempts to show love unlimited to others won't be nearly as effective as they could be. I can't give to someone what I don't receive myself. I cannot give to someone what I am not growing in and learning myself. We use a couple big churchy words sometimes and they carry a lot of meaning. The first one is justification. Some people define and remember that word by saying, just as if I never sinned. It's that moment in time when you recognize your mess that you've missed the mark and you repent. And here at Third City, we, we mark that moment in baptism, that moment when you let God come into your mess. And the second word is sanctification. And that one's a lifelong process where that relationship with Jesus and a growing understanding of mercy and grace helps us put the pieces of our lives back together again with his help. And as part of the church, part of Third City Christian Church, you need to know this. We are in this together. You are no different than anyone else in this room. We all have struggles and conditions, and we all experience crisis. You should, by now, I think, have a card in front of you, right? Someone else's card, and I'm going to ask you to represent that person. I'm going to read each question, and I'm going to ask you to stand up if your card is marked yes first one, have you ever struggled with depression, fear, or anxiety? Take a look around. You're not alone. You can sit down. Number two, have you ever lied about, gossiped about, or made fun of another person? Y'all better stand up, right? <laughs> look around you. You are with people like you. You can have sit, you can sit down. This will be the best workout a lot of us get this week. <laughs> Number three, have you ever been addicted to something? Stand up. Folks, you're not alone. Sit down. Number four, have you ever been physically abused or physically abusive? Stand up. We're sorry for your hurt. And grace and forgiveness run deep. You can sit down. Have you ever been sexually abused or sexually abusive? Stand up. <clears throat> Again, we're in this together. We walk in this together. You can sit down. Have you ever thought about or attempted suicide? Please stand up. Your church is your church. And we long to, to, to walk together and to help. You can 
can be seated. Have you ever had a sexual relationship with someone you weren't married to? Stand up. Are you starting to get the point? The enemy wants to divide us. The enemy wants to make us think, I, you're the only one. You can sit down. You're the only one who deals with all of this stuff. But we know the truth. We know that we're in this together. Have you ever struggled? Just stand up. Have you ever struggled with attractions, thoughts, or behaviors that are outside of God's will for your life? You can sit down. And then finally, do you have any secrets that you'd never want someone to find out? Stand up. <coughs> Folks, we are the church. We're called to be in this together. You can sit down. There's not a single person here who doesn't experience crisis and condition in their life. I'm going to ask you to do one more thing with that card. I want you to take it home with you. And I want you to commit to praying for that person. You don't know who it is. But in doing that, you're also going to know that someone here is praying for you as we receive that grace and that redemption, as we receive that new life and that resurrection in some part of us that might be dead. You see, some of you are just checking this whole Jesus thing out. Someone invited you and maybe you've just run out of other options for how to deal with brokenness. And so you found your way here. Uh, folks, you're not alone. You just saw that. Please continue to ask questions. Maybe you've never prayed, but I'd encourage you today to say, God, if you're real, will you in some way call out my child, get up? For a lot of us here, you've already made that decision to follow Jesus. You placed your faith, your trust in the blood of Jesus. You see, justification doesn't just say that God chooses to ignore your messiness, your sin. It says that God chose to deal with your sin. And he does that by sending Jesus to die on a cross to make it possible for my sin and your sin, our messiness, to be washed away. And so we practice communion here together. We take a piece of bread that represents the body of Christ and we remember that Jesus was beaten and mocked and put on a cross. And we take a cup of juice that represents his blood. His blood was poured out for you and me on behalf uh, uh, of our sin, to wash away that sin. And together we set aside a few minutes to remember and to celebrate and to give thanks. And you need to know if you're new with us, if this is your first time here, if you call on Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are welcome to join us in this time. And then we're going to have a moment where some offering trays are passed, and, and for us, it's a chance to worship. We give back a portion of what he's given us in thanks and trust and in worship. We remember that everything belongs to him. And then I'll come back out here and we'll share a little bit of a challenge. Let me pray. God, you are a good God. And none of us deserve what we're about to celebrate. But because you meet us in the midst of our crisis and our condition, and especially our sin condition, we can be washed clean and we can experience new life, better life, resurrection. And so we take this few minutes to remember and to give thanks and to celebrate. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to just take a moment and think about the two people in this passage in Luke 8 who received a miracle. Their lives were for sure never the same again. It was out there for people to see. But think specifically about the woman, the one called daughter. Her goal was pretty simple. Sneak in get her Jesus fix and go away just as anonymously as she had lived the past 12 years. But Jesus knew that she needed healing be beyond her physical condition. See, no doubt it would have been a blessing to her just to have the bleeding stop, right? But Jesus goes beyond that be though to bring her back to life spiritually and socially and relationally probably the first time in a long time anyone had called her daughter. 
probably the first time in a long time anyone had interacted, at, interacted with her without someone saying, unclean. <clears throat> you know, that temptation is real for us too. To just sneak in, get our Jesus fixed, and sneak out. We're a big enough church that it's pretty easy to kind of stay in the shadows. And that's, that's okay for a while. Come in this music right when the Come in this room right when the music starts. Get out of here right as it's finishing up. Maybe even have your cell phone ready to fake a phone call in case someone wants to talk to you. We've all done it. You just look for the quick Jesus fix. But we need to go away from here knowing that we are always better when we're together. Maybe for you it's time to take that step of being part of a rooted group. Sign up for that starts next week. My wife and I are signing up. I hope you will too. And this morning we want to invite you to do something uh, around the edges of the room here. Whether you've been here for two weeks or for two decades, we want you to take an important step today. You'll see that on some tables we have panels of glass and some bright markers. Before you leave here, whether it's during one of the next couple songs or when we're all done, whether you're sitting down here or you're up in the balcony, uh, we want you to to put your name on one of these panels of glass. We're going to build that towards Easter. But we want you to write your name small enough that the next service can get their names on those panels as well. And And in doing that, you're saying a couple of things. First, you're saying, I'm here. As a person who's heard Jesus call out my name or someone who is just learning to listen, I'm going to be here. And number two, you're saying, uh, I'm ready to be known. Maybe it's time to reject anonymity in your life and to live this out together. He's given us each other to deal with the crisis and the condition. As we worship, would you do that today?